All right, if you got a Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, go ahead and grab it, and we're going to be in the prophecy of Hosea once more. Hosea, chapter 7, we're reaching the midway point of this book. We're a church, if you're newer with us, we're a church that just kind of typically walks through chapters, walks through books of the Bible, and that's what we're doing. We believe all of Scripture is inspired by God. All of Scripture is profitable for His people. And none of Scripture was put there by accident. And so, Hosea, yes, it's been heavy. It's been gripping. It's been disruptive and disturbing at times as we have again and again and again seen on display, heralded from the pen of the prophet here, our sin. Uh, And if you're hoping that light breaks through, it does in about six weeks. So just (laughs) keep coming back, all right? Keep coming back, Um, but not this morning. Not too much. We're gonna, well, we will get there, okay? There will be some encouragement. But Hosea chapter seven. So as you guys remember, the first three chapters, if you've been with us, the first three chapters are really this kind of biographical sketch and illustrative form of the young prophet Hosea who was called by the Lord to go and marry a whore. And he finds this whore, he marries her, he pours his love upon her, he becomes her husband, showers her with affection, devotion, and yet she continues to run back again and again into her adultery, into her prostitution. And it is this grand analogy, even though it's a true story, it's this grand analogy of how the Lord who has pursued his people and loved his people and wed his people and rescued his people feel when his people are wayward and unfaithful and run from him. And then you enter chapter four, as we did a few weeks ago, and it's almost like Hosea Hosea just kind of shelves the illustration, the narrative, and goes right after the heart of the people. So, okay, I've, I've, I've opened up with this illustration of who God is and his radical devotion, his unrelenting love for his people, and what our sin does to his heart. And now I'm just going to begin to call out again and again and again the idolatry of your hearts, the waywardness of your souls, and again and again, call you back to the Lord to repent before him. So that has kind of been the refrain. And now we come to chapter seven and that refrain in many ways continues. We're really going to start in chapter six, verse 11 this morning because there's a clear division between the first half of that verse and the second half of the verse. But it says this, Hosea 6, 11, when... I restore the fortunes of my people when I would heal Israel. Now, unquestionably, this is blessing. And it's not just that he is going to do it when this occurs. It's that I have done it, the Lord is saying. I have poured out blessing. I've poured out blessing nationally in delivering you and choosing you to be my people, delivering you from the bondage in Egypt. I have poured out blessing collectively upon you. My presence has dwelt with you. I poured out blessing upon you individually. When I would heal, when I would restore the fortunes of my people. So most of you guys know if you were here last week, but Deshaun, our student pastor, got sick last week. He wasn't able to go for the first day and a half of student life camp with the middle and high school students this week. And so I took his place. I stepped in. It's been years since I had been to a student life camp, teenage camp. And so I went, didn't know what to expect, but I arrived and the kids, our students were very accommodating, welcomed me in, ate dinner with them. We had some jokes, some laughs. We went to session that night. We kind of picked apart what was good and picked apart what was not good. And I kind of ran it through the grid of biblical critical thinking. Woke up the next morning, hung out throughout the day, did many life groups, Bible studies, great time, better than I expected, quite honestly. And Tuesday, um, late afternoon, I had to head back this way to Sean was taking my place. And so I was telling everybody that I was leaving. And one of the high schoolers said, hey, we made something for you. And they handed me a card. It said, thank you on the front of the envelope. Oh, this is really nice. Didn't expect this. Made my way out to my truck, got in, opened up the card, And the card contained phrases like, camp would have been so much better if you hadn't come. Okay? Or another phrase was, we learned nothing from you this week. Thanks for nothing. Now, if you're shocked this morning, look, have no fear. I'm making this up. 
the campers did not give me. They didn't give me a thank you note. So some of your parents need to talk to them about that. But um, no, but at least there was no derision, right? There was no derision. Like, it wasn't like I drove over there. I took time away from my family. I tried to instruct them and tried to hang out with them. And, and I was paid back for, um, for my blessing upon them with derision. But that's exactly the shockwave that God levels upon his people here in Hosea chapter seven. He says, when I would bless you, when I would heal you, when I would manifest my presence to you, when I would redeem you back to myself, the thank you card that I get back from you, my people, is derision. Is, you know what? Our lives would be better if you were not in them. We don't need you. We don't learn from you. Like we've gone through hard times. We've gone through pain as we saw last week. We've gone through heaviness and darkness and reproach and dissension. All these things have faced us. And the gods of Canaan have been more faithful than you have. When I would restore the fortunes of my people, when I would come and bless, prove my faithfulness, heal Israel, even then the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed and the evil deeds of Samaria for they deal falsely. Uh, everything in this first verse is, is kind of saturated with deceit. We've already talked about this. The people of Israel look good on the surface, many of them. They're still going to worship. They're still offering up sacrifices. They're still serving in some form or fashion the Lord. And yet, there's this uncovering of iniquity. There's this revealing of evil deeds. They deal falsely. They're like a thief that breaks in and the bandits that raid outside, verse two now. But they do not consider that I remember all their evil. And this is one of the gravest mistakes they make. And if I'm honest, this is one of the gravest mistakes I make and I think that we make today is that we liken God to us. As my wife Danielle says when we get in arguments that it's pointless for her to argue because I never forget anything. We just keep going back and forth. And she's like, how do you remember this stuff? It was like 13 years ago. And, uh, and so I bring it up to her. But, so she'll say you don't forget anything, but that's simply not true. One case in point was last Sunday. I think it was last Sunday. The third, whenever the third was. Um, June 3rd, uh, we got the kids in bed. Um, they finally fall asleep after reading to them. We come downstairs, Danielle and I were sitting in our library. She pops open a bottle of wine and we just are talking, kind of conversing, are hanging out like we all should do with our spouses, right, I think. And, uh, and a text comes in. We both have our phones. A text comes in from my mom. Happy anniversary, you two. And I looked at her and she looked at me and I said, did you remember? She's like, nope. I'm like, okay, I'm not in trouble then. Like everything's, it's all good. I didn't remember either. You didn't remember. And in fairness, it's like our second anniversary. If you've been here a while, you know this. We eloped and then we had like a fake marriage to fool everyone. And so it says that second fake one that was kind of going on there. And, uh, and so, but, but I didn't remember. Didn't remember June 3rd. Sometimes I've forgotten February 19th, my actual anniversary. We forget. We've got so many distractions, so many issues pulling for our attention all the time. We can only focus albeit at times poorly, on one thing at a time, truly focus on that. And what happens is we assume unconsciously that that is how God himself operates. I am, God, there's so much going on in the world right now. I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on in Ukraine or in Washington or in Hollywood or across the state of Florida COVID, monkeypox, whatever it might be, all this stuff, God, you got bigger, grander, more serious things to pay attention to than us. And here's the reality. When we talk about God being an infinite God, what we are saying, at least in part, is that God's attention can be 100% focused on Ukraine, 100% focused on Washington, 100% focused on all the calamity and issues that 
are pervasive in the world today and 100% focused on you, 100% focused on me. He doesn't have to splice up his time. He doesn't have to divide his holy focus. And he says, you're, Aaron, you're foolish because you think that I don't remember. You think I forget your transgression. But what does he say? The iniquity of Ephraim is revealed, the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely, the thief breaks in, the bandits right outside, but they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them, they are before my face. In October, I kind of told you guys this, October we hired a pool company to remodel our entire pool. It was just in disrepair. And they told us we'd be swimming by Thanksgiving. And uh, Thanksgiving came and went, and the supplies hadn't even been dropped off. And then December came and went, and then January came and went, and then February came and went. First of March, finally the papers got dropped off. They're like, hey, water will be in the pool in two and a half weeks. Uh, two months later, water was in the pool. And for the last month, our pool has looked like this. Okay? It's beautiful. And um, I kind of get this vibe that whenever Danielle or I call them or email them or text them or anything, that, uh, that these beautiful people who are remodeling our pool are just hoping that one day we'll forget. <laughs> so we'll just forget that the pool's not supposed to be that color. And we'll forget that we maybe hired them. I don't know. Like, we'll just forget. But what happens is in the morning, I wake up and I make my coffee and I walk out onto the back veranda and I'm looking out and this monstrosity is staring me in the face. It's ever before me when I'm in the backyard. I see it. The Lord is saying, this is what the sin of my people is like for me. It's before my face. It's in my face. It's rubbing salt in the wound. And it's also important that we remember that the Lord is not like us in that he is divinely, wholly focused on each of us entirely. But he's also not like us in that um, he doesn't just remember yesterday like we remember yesterday, but he is in yesterday. Right? This is what we mean by the transcendence of God. He is in tomorrow. He's not just, he doesn't just know tomorrow. He's there. He supersedes time. He's outside. It's, we can't grasp this fully, wrap our minds around it. But our sin, the sin that we committed 10 years ago, the sins of the people of Israel are still fresh before his face. Like his offense does not wane. He sees all sin equally in his sights. And so he says, they do not remember that I remember, they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Their deeds surround them. They are before my face. I see them constantly, constantly in offense. By their evil, they make the king glad and the princes by their treachery. It's important to remember historically that this is taking place around uh, the middle of the eighth century BC. And during the prophecy of Hosea, there are four kings in the southern kingdom of Judah, and there are at least two in the northern kingdom of Israel. And four of those six kings in the two kingdoms are dethroned by way of execution and overthrown by another king wanting the rightful place of the current king and rallying the people. And so by the people's atrocity and betrayal, they make the princes and the king happy. They're all unfaithful. They're all adulterers. And then you're gonna see a phrase here. Remember, this is poetry. So he's pressing before us a phrase um, that really denotes the heart of the people. And it really uh, communicates this idea of out of control, misplaced passion. They are like a heated oven. They're inflamed. They're out of control. Whose baker ceases to stir the fire. So he's not tending the fire. He's falling asleep. He's growing apathetic and the fire blazes out of control. It takes down the residence from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. So this is again and again the idea of he, we have failed, the people have failed to watch. On the day of our king, verse five, the princes became sick with the heat of wine. This is overindulgence, drunkenness. It should be a day, this coronation, the day of the king should be a day of really not only celebrating the king, but remembering God's faithfulness to the people. That when they asked for a king, he gave them a king, but instead the people overindulge, hearts burning out of control, he stretched out, the king stretched out his hand with mockers. So the king here is making alliances with the enemies of God, those who would be opposed to the ways of Jehovah. 
Verse six, for with hearts like an oven, there it is again, they approach their entry. I circled this this week. Because I'm like, that is very descriptive of 21st century Christianity in America. What piques our curiosity? We are easily, I'm an easily distracted individual. And when something arouses my curiosity or my desires, my heart moves in that direction. That's what he says. Their hearts like an oven, they approach their entry, that which piques their curiosity, that which arouses them. All night their anger smolders. It keeps them up from sleep. Stop me if it sounds familiar. Their bitterness, their resentments robs them of God-gifted sleep. And in the morning, that bitterness and that anger blazes like a fire out of control. All of them are hot as an oven and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen and none of them calls upon me. They refuse to turn back, though it's right in front of their face. They know what to do. I don't know about you guys, but like I know what to do. When I feel that my relationship with the Lord is cold, when it has waned, when it has grown stale, when he feels distant from me, I know what scripture calls me to do. Most of us here probably know what scripture calls us to do. But there's a refusal oftentimes, like the people of Israel, to turn back. Verse 8, Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. This is the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Ammonites and the Moabites, like all the people who hate God, who are opposed to God. So they're just ingrained with, saturated by the culture around them. Ephraim is like a cake not turned. And so what they would do is they would place this bread or these cakes in the oven. And after a time, the baker would come and he would flip them over so they can be equally browned on both sides. But he says, you think you're complete. But really, um, this is kind of gives us echoes of Matthew chapter six, where Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. You think you can. You think you can serve the God of culture and the God of this world, the God of self and the God of eternity, but you can't. You're like a cake unturned, browned on just one side. Verse nine, now we see the effects of what our sin does. Strangers devour his strength and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him and he knows it not. So, um, I'm 42, okay? I know I don't look it. I'm 42, and uh, kidding. And um, I don't know about you, if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it doesn't matter. But if you're anything like me, I don't honestly feel 42. Time just has passed, so I'm 42. And I don't feel that. I don't really acknowledge that. I don't really think about that until I go to something like student life camp. And I walk into the first session and the music is so loud. <laughs> I mean, it's just so loud. And I'm pretty sure my heart starts to beat in rhythm with the bass. I feel like I'm a faint. There's all this fog and smoke everywhere. I can't see what's going on. These people are close to me and they're jumping around. My knees would hurt if I jumped around like that. Confetti bursts and falls from the ceiling. The Holy Spirit's clearly in this place, you know, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> and in my snark, in my snark, within the first 30 minutes, 30 seconds of being at camp, I'm going, dude, when did you get old? When did this happen? It just kind of snuck up on you. You didn't prepare for it. You didn't plan for it. It just happened. Well, what he does is he uses that physical reality um, to convey a deep spiritual significance. Uh, as we begin to still claim allegiance to the God of the Bible, Jesus is my king, but our hearts are led to these other idols, to self-centeredness, to an engagement with, in a compromised fashion, the culture around us. He says, what happens, it's, it's spiritually, it's likened to the hair turning gray and us not even realizing it. Our strength disintegrating and we don't even know that we're weak. We're lulled into, rocked into this state of spiritual slumber, so to speak. That's what he's saying is happening here to the people. So don't miss this. 
for many of the people, it's not, their sin is not so grotesque outwardly that the people around them notice it. This entire passage we're about to see it is about the heart. And yes, that does manifest itself outwardly, but typically in the forms that we have seen here in the text, all right? So it says, verse nine, strangers devour his strength. He knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him and he knows it not. The pride, there it is, the pride of Israel testifies to his face. It's very clear, it's on the surface. We saw this back in chapter four. Yet they do not return to the Lord their God nor seek him for all of this. It's very clear that the only refuge, the only hope for them is Yahweh their God. And yet, in spite of the fact that their sin is clearly testifying of their transgression, they don't seek him at all. They don't return to him. Verse 11, Ephraim is like a dove. Finally, something sweet and cute. You, my people, you're like doves. Nope, not so fast. Silly and without sense. So apparently Hosea was at student life camp. Silly and without sense. Ephraim's like a dove. They're cute. Oh, like that's, no, they're directionless. They don't know where they're going. They're silly. They're without sense. And this is what happens in their sin. And when the weight of their transgression begins to, the, to stare them in the face and they see the consequence, what do they do? They refuse to seek me. And instead they run to two places, the past and the future. They run to Egypt for help. Who's Egypt again? Well, they're the land, the kingdom that took the Israelites captive for more than 400 years and not only enslaved the Israelites, but barbarically massacred the little boys who cursed the name of God, our deliverer. And so in this moment of feeling covered up, man, life is not going as I had planned and this probably is the result of my sin Instead of returning to the Lord, let's go back to Egypt. Let's go ask Egypt for help. Or better yet, let's go to the superpower of our day. Let's trust in their might and their military strength and their cunning and their strategic planning, Assyria. Now, Assyria is the nation that will take them captive shortly, will enslave them in the future. We've already seen that. There's already been a warning about this. But when the people feel guilt-riddled, I need relief from this. We'll go to Assyria. So what do we know about Assyria? Well, a contemporary of Hosea in scripture was Jonah. Hosea prophesied to the people of God there in Israel. He was an internal prophet. And Jonah was more so an external prophet going to prophesy to the Assyrians in their capital city of Nineveh. And history records uh, that America has nothing on the Ninevites when it comes to violence and brutality. Most likely, the Ninevites were a cannibalistic people. They had their own gods that they have erected around the city and around the empire, but really their God is their brutal strength. It's recorded that outside of the cities of Assyria, including Nineveh, they would drape the skins of the men that they had conquered in battle, and they would mount the heads of women and children all around the city as a warning to anyone who dare come up against Nineveh. And this is who the people of God are running to, for relief, for rescue. That's pretty heavy. Like a dove, silly, without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. Verse 12, as they go, I will spread over them my nets. So this might sound foreboding, but it's also reassuring. He's gonna talk about discipline here in this text. And this discipline, as we've talked about in this series, this net being spread over God's people, yes, it is restrictive, but it also is God's grace bringing his people back to himself. As they go, I'm not gonna give up on them. I spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. So it's gonna hurt. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. So according to their own testimony, 
of apathy and indifference and a divided heart. Verse 13, Woe to them, for they've strayed from me. So this is the caution, it's a warning. Woe to them, they've strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. Like we, we tend to see um, the Lord as a big bully at times. At times we see the Lord as a bully who's just out to make our lives miserable. He wants to keep us from all that is fun. And we, a few weeks ago, we had, still had passes to Bush Gardens. We went to Bush Gardens and we're over by the little airplanes. And Augustine's riding the airplanes and Evie's tired of the airplanes. That's my five-year-old little girl. And she uh, wants to go over and look at the carousel. And I'm like, don't go over and look at the carousel. And so I'm kind of watching her. Danielle wasn't with us. I'm just taking the three kids in the stroller, cruising around. And so Spurgeon's there, my oldest, and Augustine's on the airplane. And Evie walks over. And so as she walks over, the airplane ride ends. She's kind of peering over the edge there, looking the opposite direction. So I'm like, hey, Spurgeon, jump in real quick. Augustine, get in here. And we, and we motor around the corner. Now, I keep my eye on her. I'm a terrible parent, right? But I keep my eye on her because I'm not going to let her out of my sight but I'm just waiting and sure enough, she turns around and she sees where I once was and she freaks out. The, the, for me anyway, the lesson that I'm trying to communicate to her is that when, when daddy gives you an order, tells you not to do something or to do something, you decide not to or to do the opposite of what I've instructed you not to do, it is for your ultimate good. Like here, like what, what happens to my little girl if she continues to wander off? She continues to disobey. We'd be loath to think of like what would happen, what could happen to her, what destruction she could be met with. And here the people of God continue to stray from the Lord. They continue to rebel against him. And the Lord out for their ultimate good, the ultimate good of his people says destruction awaits I would redeem them, I have redeemed them, but still they speak lies against me. Verse 14, and we just need to pause there for a second because this is one of the things we talked about with the campers this week quite a bit, and um, I was actually really, really encouraged by uh, the critical thinking and observation and astuteness of a lot of our campers as they would hear things. They would hear things that are being regurgitated throughout Christianity today, whether in music form or in teaching form or in discussions, and they would begin to pick that apart biblically. Because what's happening is a lot of people that claim that Christ has redeemed them are spreading, if we're honest, lies through music and through teaching and through conversation about the Lord. They're, we're oftentimes painting him in a way that is grossly inaccurate. And so he says, when I would redeem them, they speak lies against me. That's, that's after like one, one of the leaders came up to me the other day and said, oh, what'd you think? And I just... <laughs> probably regretted asking me the question because I said, I just don't like when preachers or teachers lie. And he's like, well, I don't know if I would call it lying. I'm like, what would you call not telling the truth? What would we call that? Like, look, I know we live in this incredibly individualistic society, but we don't get to make up about God what we want God to be. That's right. We just don't get to do that. We don't get to lie about him. Verse 14. They do not cry to me from the heart. There it is, bingo. That is the essence of the entire text. From the, so they are crying to me. Look, they're wailing upon their beds. So they're putting on a good show on Instagram. I mean, their Instagram feed is all King Jesus. On Twitter, on Facebook, um, in church on Sundays, like they're putting on this good show. They're wailing before me. They're acknowledging that I'm sovereign, but they do not cry to me from the heart. For grain and wine, what's absent here? God. So they're crying out for the stuff I'll give them, their needs and their desires, and they're crying out for that. And they're gnashing or gashing themselves. So right away, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, 1 Kings 18 would come to mind. Another prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel, Elijah's there on Mount Carmel, and he allows for several hours the prophets of Baal to call out to the gods of Canaan, Baal specifically. Hear us, come to us. And what do they do in their crying, in their wailing? They begin to cut themselves, believing that this display will bring down the recognition of their gods. And so he says, this is what you're doing. 
For grain and wine, they gashed themselves. They rebel against me. Verse 15, although I trained and strengthened their arms. Or in other words, the reason why you, nation of Israel, the reason why us here have anything that we have, anything, is because of God's good grace. Anything. And the reason we have friends, the reason we have families, the reason we can pound a donut this morning, the reason for some of us why that donut doesn't show, okay? The reason why we can drink a glass of wine or a glass of beer or enjoy a good buffet or whatever it might be, all of those temporal things, the reason why we have air conditioning and a swimming pool, and much more significantly, the reason why you and I have peace with God, conviction by his spirits, his revelation, all of it, he says, is my gift to you. My good grace commonly or savingly displayed. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, I gave them everything, yet they still devised evil against me. They return. So don't, don't miss this again. Like, it's really important because I need to hear this, okay? Hosea was written for us, for me, for you. They return. So the people are making once again a good display. They're coming back. Let's go back to the Lord. Let's seek his face, but not upward. They're like a treacherous bow, so they're like a bow that can't shoot the arrow straight. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue, because of their boasting, because the pride that's before their face, the, the nation will fall. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. So they're not going back to Egypt. That's poetic. It's a poetic proclamation of what it's going to look like when they actually are enslaved in Assyria. This is going to be their derision. They're going to remember that it was just smoke and mirrors. It was just to show less return, less worship the Lord, but it wasn't genuine. They do not cry to me from the hearts. So what do we do with this text? Okay, we come to an, the end of another chapter. And so um, we asked ourselves, what, what's here for us? Right? What is the Lord communicating to us? And the first is the reality that there's this warning, there's this caution, woe, beware, concerning misplaced passions. Like misplaced passions that, that my heart, the heart wants what the heart wants. And we, that's very popular in our day. We almost affirm that even in the church. Follow your heart. Do what pleases you. Do you. And the Lord here is warning us about how that appears in his sight and the ramifications involved with that ultimate heart betrayal. So on Thursday nights, we have service here, same as Sunday in case you ever can't make a Sunday. 6.45, we have service. And almost every Thursday, my two oldest kids, Spurgeon who's eight, Evie who's five, come with me to church. Um, but um, I don't believe, I think it's really dumb when we as parents ground our kids from coming to church. Like, right, that doesn't make any sense at all. And yep, we do it. Um, but I feel like Thursday is not like they're typical. They're typically, they're Sunday morning people. They come, they learn and worship. And Thursday is a chance to be with dad. And so that is more of a privilege. And two Thursdays ago, we're doing band practice and I give my kids really clear instruction and Spurgeon was following those instructions and Evie was not. And she was distracting, she was interrupting band practice. And then after band practice, a couple of the boys who were here at church come to me and tell me that she's screaming in their face and she's punching them. Okay. So uh, we go home and on the way home, I'm like, Evie, you're not coming to church next Thursday. So I'm going to go on Sunday because your little patient heart needs it, but you're not, going to, you're not going to come with me on Thursday. She's like, please, day, please. And I'm like, no, no, no. And then we get home and you would think, like, I mean, it's just been like 30 seconds since you were punching people and you were screaming at them. And we get in the bathroom to brush their teeth. I'm brushing Evie's teeth. Spurgeon says something, anything, doesn't matter what it is. And she punches him. I'm like, that does it. Go in your room. Discipline's coming. I'm gonna finish up with Spurgeon and I'll be in there. So I start to brush Spurgeon's teeth, finish up. I'm like, hey buddy, go back in your room now. I gotta take care of Evie. And I walk into Evie's room and this is what I see. <laughs> now for all those who said, oh, don't even give me that. <laughs> You're not even her parent and you know darn well what she's doing right there. That is not legitimate contrition. She is on her knees and going, oh gods of Canaan, Please, like, save me. 
Save me from the ferocity of my father. I don't like what's about to happen now. I don't like what the consequence of my sin is. And so even my little girl who's adorable and I love, I see in her and I see in me what can look good, but is a heart that is far from God. One of the most haunting passages in scripture and you see it here when he talks about how gray is popping up in the hair and we don't even notice it and our strength is replaced with weakness, but we're not even aware, um, is in Judges chapter 16, where the story of Samson there, and of course, Samson is anointed by the Lord to be a deliverer, one of the judges in Israel. In Israel. And yet his heart continues to lead him astray. He's like the oven burning out of control, particularly sexually, and so he focuses in on, in those chapters, a most likely a Philistine named Delilah, at least someone whose heart is far from the Lord. And she keeps trying to coax out of him, you know the story, keeps trying to coax out of him the secret to his great strength. What is the secret? And finally he tells her, well, I'm, I'm a Nazarite. I'm taking this vow before the Lord. A razor cannot come from my head. If my hair is cut, I'll lose all my strength. And he falls asleep and she cuts his hair, and then she says to him, Samson, get up. She's done it so many times. I mean, how stupid do you have to be, right? This is like the fourth time that she's like, hey, the Philistines are here. I don't know how. And uh, he rises out of bed, and chapter 16 says these words. Samson shook himself as times before, but he did not know that the presence of the Lord had departed from him. So on the surface, everything typically seems right and good. Let's return to the Lord. Let's go back to him. Let's worship him together. But we have to ask ourselves this morning. We don't need to be looking around, asking anybody else. Hey, this is for me. Um, Where is my heart before the Lord? Where are my passions? I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming for us where our passions, where our heart truly lies. And that kind of brings me to, um, at least for me this week, as I'm studying this text, what I was encouraged by. Because there's two ways. As we look at this text and we think about heart motivation, there are really two motivators for us. I would say far and away the greatest, and by greatest I mean the most used motivator, not the best, the most used motivator in Christianity is guilt. So we read Hosea 4, 5, 6, 7, and we're like, you're right. You're right. I'm terrible. My heart is far from the Lord. I might might look the part. I might say the right things. I might serve. I might dance around. I might raise my hands in worship. I might sing the songs. My heart is far from the Lord. But if guilt is our motivation, we will try. Now hear me say this. If you went to camp this week, if you walked away going, I've got to tell more people about Jesus, I gotta read my Bible more. Like I just, I mean, I just felt so guilty. I'm not talking about godly conviction, but I'm just talking about, I just felt so guilty, so beaten up that I'm gonna do it. That'll last about a week. Like guilt is a poor catalyst for faithfulness. Just can't do it. So either you're gonna be like, you're gonna reach the point where you go, can't do it. There's a greater love like we talked about last week. There's a, a greater distraction now. God isn't quite as enamoring as he was a week ago or a month ago or a year ago. Or on the flip side of that, if guilt is motivating you, you hey, it happens. You might be sitting here this morning and be like, I'm not, I'm not these people. Like, I'm pretty pristine. I mean, I've got my struggles, but I'm really obedient and really faithful. And then what happens if guilt's motivating us? We start to pat ourselves on the back. Like, I heard at youth camp this week, True. Like the Bible is not parading us constantly before the watching eyes. It's parading him before our watching eyes. So it's not about my faithfulness and how good I have been or how how good I think I have been. Like guilt is this poor motivator. So I don't want to, I don't need to walk out of here today going, man, I just got, I got to do better. I got to do more. I got to pull up my bootstraps. I got to kneel by the bed. Try to make God happy with me again. Instead, the greatest motivator, truly, I know we hear it. This is why we're going to start to unpack it this Wednesday in class. But the greatest motivator 
to walk in faithfulness before the Lord is his grace. And believe me, I know this, when we start talking true, radical, reorienting, scandalous grace, there will always be people who want to abuse it. Meaning there will always be people who are like, hey, God loves me no matter what I do. I'm just gonna do what I wanna do. And quite honestly, like those are hearts that don't get it. But when we understand, when you understand, when I understand, truly understand in the soul, not just in the mind, in the soul, what Christ has done for us, the manifestation of God's grace and truth to us, Christ Jesus, when we get it, it reorients us. So as we look at this passage this morning, we can say, yes, the sin is great, but the graciousness that is God himself is greater. I was reading this book this week on Thursday morning and uh, in preparation for our class, but one of the quotes here, so many good quotes, books entitled Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul. I'd highly recommend it if you want a better understanding of biblical grace. But one of the quotes jumped out at me and I, I love this, especially in light of Hosea 7 and this guilt versus grace breakdown. He says this, he's talking about God's sovereignty and human will free will, volition, whatever. And he says this, here's the reality. God is free and I am free. But God is more free than I am. If my freedom runs up against God's freedom, I lose. His freedom restricts mine. My freedom does not restrict his. That is what sovereignty is all about. If God's sovereignty is restricted by man's freedom, then God is not sovereign, man is sovereign. Now we live in a day, even in Christianity, where we really suppose that man is sovereign, but he's not, we're not. Even half the things that I wanna do, either I can't do or I want to, okay? I've been saying for like three weeks, I'm gonna start eating 1,700 calories a day and getting on the treadmill every day. I have the capacity to do that. I don't have the earnest desire. So it hasn't happened, but once, okay? So that's, that's, that's what we deal with here. But more than that, like when I read this, and you might not see it this way, but this is comforting to me. Because if my will, <laughs> I know this is gonna be shocking for some of us, but if, if my will, and I would argue if your will got its way, if my sovereignty was greater than God's sovereignty, it would only ever lead to destruction. Only. We're like Israel. We're not like Hosea, not typically. God's like Hosea. And his grace is sovereign. And he gets his way. And he will redeem. And he will rescue. And he will bring back his people. And he will continue. Like the the most radical passage uh, in this entire text is, um, verse 11 of chapter six and verse one of chapter seven. I'll bless. I'll heal. Why the heck are you gonna do that? Like, have you noticed these people that you're talking about? No, I will bless and I will heal because I love them because I am a gracious, faithful God. And these are the people as jacked up as they are of my covenant. When we get that, when we truly get that, when we ingest that, it's transformative. It's transformative. Like our life, we don't live under this cloud of guilt and shame being weighed down anymore. Instead, we breathe in the reality of God's lavish grace upon us and worship explodes. I would, I would argue, and with this we done, I'll, I'll argue whether you're a student here this, and you went to youth camp this week or whether you're an adult or whoever, whoever you are, if you're a believer, if you trust in Christ, the most legitimate, ardent moments of worship in your life, expressive worship, are not when someone has looked at you and said, worship. But it's when your mind and your heart have been so captivated with truth that it overflows. That's biblical grace. And I hope that we understand. I hope we experience it. I hope we walk in it.